Okay, we'll keep moving. Let's grab our Bibles. You ready? I, we're, we're, it's my first installment in this series that we started a couple weeks ago about God with us. God with us. And the whole idea behind this is how we can celebrate the very powerful and significant uh, influence of God's presence in our personal experience. And, and so we're going to be, we've been talking about God's presence, about becoming aware of it, about uh, how, to be tra- how it transforms us, that the presence of God is critical of that. And today we're going to talk about something that's maybe a little bit different. Now, and, and one of the things that kind of happens during these, uh, these kind of sermon series is we get to, um, we got to get to thinking philosophically. We, be, we begin to think about kind of the metaphor of God's presence. What does God's presence mean? Isn't God's presence always with us, even when we feel it, even when we don't feel it? And that's true because God, Jesus said, I'll, I'll be with you always, right? So there's no disconnect from the idea that God's presence is with us, but we want to walk in the awareness of that presence. And secondly, we want to elevate our awareness of that presence. And ultimately, we're also talking about what I would call the Shekinah or the uh, personal experience of the manifest presence of God. When God's presence is actuated, when you sense it, when you feel it, when you can identify it in real terms, not just a position of faith, not just a position of where I understand it by the scriptures, but where I'm experiencing the transformative work or what it's like to be in what I would call the manifest presence of God. Now, how many know what I'm talking about when I use that kind of language? Now, there might be people, there's only a few of you. I guess you never come to church. The point is, <laughs> the point is, is God is here and there's moments when we sense him and it is a feeling, right? It is an awareness. Uh, things like conviction come with the presence of God. Things like joy come with the presence of God. And we're going to be talking about that here in a little bit. But let's look at what Hebrews 6.19 is. I want you to be aware that Jesus did what he did to bring you into God's presence. Look what it says, 619. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. So Jesus is peeled back the veil, not just so that you can see the redemptive work of God, but so that you could actually experience God's manifest presence. The picture here is Jesus coming into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God's Shekinah glory, manifest presence, always abided. And he's saying, listen, I'm making a way for you into the presence of God. And this isn't just an eternal thing where we're all guaranteed eternal life. This is a thing we can experience in our everyday life. Not just in our eternal life, but in our everyday life. So God did, Jesus did this so that we could enter the presence behind the veil. See, there was a barrier between us and God. The barrier was our sin. The barrier was our shame. The barrier was our guilt. But Jesus removed that barrier, right? And he took the thing that separated us. The law separated us from God because it always told us how unworthy we were. But Jesus said, I've I've fulfilled. I've satisfied the righteous requirements of the law. I'm going to break down this veil. I'm going to tear it from top to bottom. I'm going to damage it beyond repair. Come on. He took your barriers and he damaged them beyond repair. There's no way that the enemy can sew those things back up and make you keep you from God's presence. The only way we are out of God's presence as believers is when we choose not to be in it. And so let's understand that. And, and, And it goes on where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So today we're not going to talk about the awareness of God's presence how we're transformed by God's presence. But today we're gonna to talk about something a little more, a little more significant, not significant, but a little more uh, uh, dynamic as it, as it relates to our responsibility in the presence of God. And I call it bearing God's presence. That we have a role, a responsibility as believers to carry God's presence everywhere we go. It's this idea that I don't live my life to myself I don't move through life just for my own reputation, for my own purposes, for my own plan, for my own satisfaction, for what makes me feel good, but I move through life with this deep sense that I have a responsibility to bring God with me and to bring a manifest. See, so it's the thing that distinguishes us. It's the thing that distinguishes a believer from anybody else in the world. 
And that'll make you a target, but it'll also create opportunity. So let me, let me, let me give you an idea. Moses said to God, God says, I'm going to send an angel. You, you guys are keep messing up with me. I'm going to send an angel in front of you to lead you through the wilderness. And Moses said, that's not good enough. Now, how many of us would be happy with an angel? But Moses said, ain't good enough. An angel, even your angel, isn't enough. If your presence doesn't go with us, how, and this is his language, how will we be different from anybody else on the planet of the earth? In other words, Moses identified the thing that made Israel, Israel, wasn't their heritage, wasn't their bloodline. It was the abiding presence of God as they moved in their journey of life. And I'm here to tell you that the thing that distinguishes us as believers isn't just that we have a faith or that we have a tradition. It is that there is this abiding sense of God's presence as we move through our journey in life. Everybody tracking with me? So we are talking about the power and significance of a personal experience in God's presence. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. <laughs> I like that. So my wife gave a, gave a great definition of presence. I'm going to give you another one, uh, once again, from a dictionary where you usually get definitions. Presence means the face, the person, the countenance, the environment. This is where I'm going with it. The environment, the atmosphere in which God is fully known and realized Amen. in our context. The environment, atmosphere in which God is fully known and realized. I'm gonna suggest that nobody here met Jesus and got saved without a deep sense of God's presence. Right. It's called the Holy Spirit, right? Brought conviction to you, you became aware of your need, you were attracted to God, you believed what he did, and you accepted it, and a, a transformative work that we call regeneration happened for you. You became a new kind of person. It didn't mean you didn't have stuff to deal with, but you, had, you became a new kind of person. There was a different motivation working in you, and that was a spiritual work that was initiated that you became immersed in first because of and by the presence of God. Everybody tracking with me? So let me share with you a couple ideas of why this is important, okay? The presence of God is a blessing. Y'all going to be quiet. You're just going to listen today. I get it. All right, here you go. Ray, let, me, let me just share with you. I'm going to go through this quickly because i got a message to preach. Okay, God's presence. This is just a few of the blessings of the presence of God. First of all, the presence of God is the seal of our salvation. The presence of God guides our life. The presence of God creates the quality of our life. The presence of God provides protection in our life. Come on, somebody. The presence of God will remove obstacles. The presence of God will bring deliverance. The presence of God gives you joy inexpressible and full of glory. The presence of God also refreshes you. If you're weary, if you're exhausted, come on, what did Jesus say? Come to me. Enter into my presence. Come on. Because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Finally, ultimately, and there's many other things, ultimately the it is, the presence of God, the environment of our relationship. How many have discovered, even though I know that uh, online is a way to have relationships today, but how many know at some point it isn't really a relationship until you get in their presence? Because they can tell you what they want to know. They can manufacture their, their little bio. They can send you their little emails. They can do their little texts. They can do everything. But it's until you begin to interrelate with them personally. It's not until then that you really know who they are. Because, boy, you, you know, in fact, the early church actually complained about that with Paul. They said, you know, his letters are weighty, but his presence is weak. In other words, you know, his emails are really awesome, but, you know, his Facebook is incredible. But when he shows up, man, he's a pipsqueak and he talks funny. Right? And, and, and we're the same way, right? You, we, oh, I just, I know them. We've been doing emails for three months. You don't know them. You don't know them.
but you ought, you ought to read their bio. It's incredible. Well, of course they wrote it. No, no, no. It ain't until you get to smell them. Right? It's not until you, you, you see the way they react to you and the way they exchange. They give you those visual and auditory cues that demonstrate who they really are. Anybody tracking with me? That's when you figure out who they are. So I don't care how people want to present themselves. Ultimately, it's when you begin to live with them, when you begin to abide in their presence, that you really discover who they are. And I'm here to tell you, you can read the Bible till you're, you, you, you think you got it figured out, but it's until you're in the presence of God that all of a sudden all that starts to make sense. So, so, so our, our faith is not just built on what we learn, what we cognitively process, even our systems of belief. It is also formatted by our experience in his presence. So how do we build on this? Here, here's, a, here's a little statement from A.W. Tozer, the great, great preacher in his book called The Pursuit of God, which I would encourage anybody to read. Why do some persons find God in a way that others don't? Why does God manifest his presence to some and let multitudes of others struggle along in the half-sided, half-light of imperfect Christian experience? Of course, the will of God is the same for all. He has no favorites within his household except for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that? Did that come out? He has no... I I just feel like I'm special. I got that in his presence, by the way. Some of y'all need to lighten up a little bit. He has no... He has no favorite... He has no favorites within his house. Now look at somebody say, except for me. (laughs) Y'all just way too serious. All he has ever done for any of his children, he will do for all of his children. The difference lies not with God, but with us. We envy others' experience with God thinking that for some reason God has stepped over us, but it's not true. The truth is, it's the way we're relating to God. So here's what I want you to understand today. If you don't understand anything else, I want you to understand that you and I are called to carry the presence of God. We're called to carry it. Or called to bear the presence of God. Now, the word bear or carry literally means to hold up, to take support from one place to another, to wear, to hold, or to have around one. So we understand that as carry, right? So if you go to First Chronicles, <clears throat> there is a statement made by David, and here's what it says. It says, no one except the Levites may carry the Ark of God. Now, the Ark of God is the symbol, the metaphor, the type for the presence of God. That's what it is. That's what it represented. It was God with Israel. It was defined by the ark of God. God was so interested in giving them a a clarity of visual perspective of God's presence that he had them build an ark and then his what? His Shekinah glory presided over that. So there was the physical manufactured thing and then there was also the spiritually developed thing. And this was happening with the ark of God. The Lord has chosen them, speaking of the Levites, to carry or to bear the ark of the Lord and to serve him forever. If you go to Deuteronomy, Moses affirms that as a part of the law. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the Lord's covenant and to stand before the Lord as his ministers and to pronounce blessings in his name. These are their duties to this day. Let's keep reading. That is why the Levites have no share of property or possession of land among the other Israelite tribes. The Lord himself is their special possession, as the Lord your God told them. So the Levites were set aside. Now, there were 12 tribes in Israel. And the Levites, which the word word or the name Levi literally means attachment. That's what it means. 
that the Levites were singled out by God through the ordinances of scripture that they had one primary responsibility and that primary responsibility, you'll notice in the language, was to bear or to carry the Ark of the Covenant and to minister before the Lord. That was their primary calling. So in other words, they were the preachers, so to speak, of Israel. They were the ones that were to carry out the religious service in the temple, in the tabernacle, as a part of the national consciousness of worshiping God. Okay, that was their primary responsibility. Now, if you go a little bit later on in Scripture, you'll discover in Revelation that we are all made a kingdom of priests. You'll discover that the redemptive work of Jesus was to separate the veil to say, we're not going to have a category of priest, but we want to everyone that has faith in me to bear, to carry, and to minister before the Lord. I find that even in our modern society today, we have a group of people that believe it's certain special people's role to bear, to serve, to minister before the Lord. You need to understand that as a believer, you're all called to minister. You're all called to bear the presence of God. Everywhere you go, in every context. Now, does that mean that you're going to serve the church in a specific uh, five-fold ministry grace? Not necessarily. But it does mean that God needs his presence at the corporate office. And God needs his presence in the garage. And now God needs his presence at the manufacturing plant. And God needs his presence on the line. God needs his presence in the grocery store. He needs his presence in every environment, in every setting that there is. Come on. The, God's heart is that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. How's he going to do that? He's got to have people that will bear the presence of God everywhere they go. Now, listen, I'm not asking you to be weird or creepy because how many know that when we start talking this way, super spiritual people started getting really weird. They're sitting in their office. I can't write because I'm the presence of God is all over me. I can't type on my keyboard because get control of yourself. You can be spiritual without being weird. Jesus was very spiritual and he wasn't weird. Don't just keep looking at me. Okay. So here's, here's, what I, here's what I, everybody's called to carry. So you and I are called to bring God's presence into every environment, into every circumstance, and into every situation. Amen. We're invited to bring God's presence. When was, the primary, uh, when was the primary and most significant impact of carrying God's presence in the Old Testament? When was it most critical? It was most critical when they were going to war. They would actually take it out of the environment of worship and they would bring it into their battle. And I wanted to tell you that some of you can't find God in your battle because you can't find him in your worship. It gets easy to bring God into your battle when you... Find God always in your worship. Amen. So we're called to bring God into every environment. That was the power of Jesus, right? Everywhere he went, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God's presence is here. Jesus was the physical exclamation point of the presence of God. And everywhere he went, what was he doing? He was doing what God's presence does. He was healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead, preaching the kingdom, bringing recovery and hope and focus to the lost, to the broken, to the, to the prostitute, to the sinner. That's because that's what the presence of God does. Everybody tracking with me? And some of us find ourselves in circumstances where, where are you, God? He's like, I'm here. I'm here. You need to find me. You need to bear, come under the presence of God. So here's what we need to know. For the Levite, and we're all spiritual Levites. I'll prove it to you in a minute. To the Levite, the presence of God is what satisfies you. What did, what did the Bible say in Ezekiel? 
the priest will not have any property or possession of land, for I alone am their special possession. See, God's looking for a people who don't care about the car, don't care about the house, don't care about the bank account, but care about the Lord. That's what he's looking for. And you'll never be somebody that bears the presence of God if you don't understand that God alone is your special possession. You got him, you got everything you need. You got him, you, you'll find satisfaction, you'll find peace, you'll find comfort, you'll find joy. You'll find joy in him that you can't find in millions of dollars. You'll find peace with him that you can't find with hundreds of thousands of dollars of therapy. See? And, and the Bible tells us quite clearly that all believers, listen, all believers are the fulfillment of what the Levites, the priests, symbolized. Look at what it says, Revelation 1, 6. He, was made, he has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and all power to him forever and ever. This is, this is the summation of the exclamation of the angel of the Lord speaking and saying, listen, you all as believers are now the kingdom of priests. In other words, you're the Levites. You're the ones who the Lord is your special possession. In fact, he says, you'll have no inheritance in the land. How many are bothered by that? You'll have no inheritance in the land. The Levites don't have an inheritance in the land. Come on. In other words, in other words, there's nothing in this world that you're going to take with you or that you're going to find any fulfillment or satisfaction in. As a believer, you'll only find it in me as your special possession. That's what he's saying to us. You go to a little later on, and, and the four and twenty elders are celebrating the Lord, and they say, and you have caused them to become a kingdom of what? Priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Now, the, the, old, uh, the old scripture, it says we are a nation, right, of kings and priests. That's the uh, King James Version. Kings and priests. Think about this. I love this. Kings inherit everything, and priests inherit nothing. And with Christ, we inherit everything because we've inherited him, right? And so, and so I, I'm grateful that we're a kingdom of priests. How about you? So let's talk about the power of bearing God's presence. Let's just spend a few minutes on this subject. You, are you guys okay? Go to Joshua chapter three, and we'll start reading from here. I really like, you know, I preach a lot of places. I just like preaching at home. I really do. It's nice, nice being home, and uh, it's good to be amongst the peeps. <laughs> Did you notice my white shoes today? Yes. I'm going classic '70s. Billy was white shoes. Johnson. <laughs> white laser suit. <shoes. laughs> okay, let's go back to the scriptures. <laughs> Joshua chapter three. Now, I'll set this up. This is the end of 40 years of wandering in a wilderness. Okay, for 40 years, they've been pointing to a single place, a single destination. That single destination is what we now know as the promised land or Canaan land, Palestine specifically. And so this is the direction that God has been leading them. And by the way, what's guiding the people of Israel this whole 40 years? Uh, his presence. It's defined by a cloud. It's defined by a fire, but not only that, they didn't move until the ark moved first. So in other words, they, they saw the cloud moving and everybody would start putting their tent together, but the thing that had to go to the front of the line was the ark of the covenant. So it was this transition that heaven's informing earth and then the presence of God is leading us in earth. So there's this movement of God that's happening. So here's where we are. We're at the border of the promised land. They're on the other side of Jordan. They're east of Jordan. And they're getting ready to cross over near Jericho. And here's the language of the scriptures. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, <clears throat> excuse me, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. Now, let's look, at the, look at the instructions. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, move out from your positions and follow them. 
since you've never traveled this way before, now there, there's something that we need to understand. The direct, to get to the, to the promised land from Egypt literally was a very short trip. It, it, it really only took probably that size of people up to a month to get there. So the fact that they've been wandering around 40 years mean they had a circuit. In other words, they were beginning to develop a, what? A familiarity, a tradition of how they did things. And they begin to see God moving in traditional ways. Come on, has anybody ever been there? Hey, I noticed that the church, we, do, we have some certain traditional ways that we do things. Yeah, because we get comfortable. And it's not that God isn't in it. God's leading all of it. But he's leading this rotation, this tradition. And, 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 and they, they've been doing this for 40 years, going around and around and around. I feel like God ain't taking me anywhere. Well, he is, but he's just making sure you enjoy the topography before you get there. So they're going around and around and around and around and around. Are you with me? And then one day they don't, they stop going around and they move towards the promised land. Not when they wanted to, because they wanted to do that like in year one. This is year 40, so they had to be patient with God. They learned, had to learn how to trust him. He kept providing for them. Now I could get into all kinds of things, but I'm not going to. I want to stay on the presence of God. So God says, listen, I'm, I'm taking you someplace you've never been before. They will guide you. Who will guide you? The, the, the priest carrying the ark. They will guide you, stay about a half a mile uh, behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. It was, now you, you, we, we'll skip ahead. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above the point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarathan. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Here's the very first lesson we need to learn here. God's play, God's presence will lead you to and ultimately through your barriers. I want to say it again. God's presence will lead you to barriers. God's presence will lead you to. Listen, we all like through. None of us like to. Because there are times in following God, he takes you to a place you can't get through. He's already done this a couple times in Israel's history. The first time he brought them to the Red Sea. He brought them to an impassable place. And some of you in following God has brought you to what seems to be an impassable place. I'm following the Lord. I'm trusting God. I'm believing God. I'm walking with God. I can't get past this point. This is too hard for me. The, 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 the waters are overflowing. I can't get my stuff across. This is impossible. This is impassable. It will not be made. I cannot do this on my own. And he does it. Listen, the presence of God takes us to place, places where we discover what we don't have so we can discover what he does have. Sorry, am I yelling too much? God, God's presence leads us to impassable places. It leads us to, come on, the difficult places. It leads us to the hard places. But I'm glad he doesn't just stop there. He also leads us through. And notice what the key to breaking through was. The key to breaking through is they had to what? Step into the water with the presence of God. You see, if you step into the water without the presence of God, you gotta to learn to swim. But if you step into the presence, step into the difficulty with the presence of God, God will change the difficulty. God will change the impossible thing into what is possible. God will change the impassable thing into that which is passable. Why? Because the presence of God makes a way where there is no way. 
God's, God's presence is powerful. And, and if you bear God's presence, you can be confident that he's going to take you not only to difficult places, but through difficult places. Where are you right now? What are you facing that you can't get through? What are you looking at that you don't see the answer for? You're talking to bankers, you're talking to counselors, you're talking to financial advisors, you're talking to HR people, you're talking to pastors, and I just can't figure this out. Well, if God has brought you there, he'll get you through it. Now, now not only that, but think about this. He, He not only... He not only brings us to and through, but God's presence is the only way into God's promise. What's on the other side of this barrier? The promise that was given to their fathers hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of years ago. Over 600 years ago, this promise was given to their fathers. And they've been, listen, have you ever felt like a promise was 600 years old? You know what I mean? Yeah, the Lord told me that like 30 years ago. Yeah, I remember when God said that to me when I was 20, and now I'm 60. Yeah, God, I've used up all my strength. I've used up all my energy. You know, now God wants to use me? Well, he waited until Moses was 80. So just chillax. Just because a promise is delayed doesn't mean it's denied. But you need to understand that the way into the promise isn't your effort, isn't your time, it isn't, it isn't even just your faith. It is a combination of faith along with following and being led and bearing, caring. Listen, I'm not, here's the, here's the identity that we have to have. If I'm going to this place, I can't get there without the presence of God. And it's the presence of God that makes the way for me to get there. So I need to understand how to relate to the presence of God before I can ever get to the place that God's promised me. It is always presence before promise. Oh, I need to say that again. It is always presence before promise. You need to look at somebody, high five them and say it's always presence before promise. That was the weakest high fives I have ever seen. There's gonna be better high fives at the Chiefs game today. If you felt a mild rebuke there, that's because it was. I'm leaving this church. I can't take that. God's God's presence is the only way to God's promises. And and, and here's the other thing. God's presence is what elevates and activates our faith. Think about this. When they took the presence and they put it on their shoulders, I could get into, and I will next week, because this is a two-parter. I'm gonna bring the presence of God onto my shoulders Once I bring it onto my shelter, I elevate God's presence, guess what happens? Everybody in the camp has the faith to move. And while I'm carrying the presence of God, I'm elevating it above my thoughts. Come on. His way, his, the presence of God is here, and here's my my thoughts. His, His presence is above my thoughts. His ways are above my ways. Everybody tracking with me? And as I'm bearing God's presence, I all of a sudden hear God say, step into the water. But Lord, the water is deep. And I'm carrying a 400-pound chest. In other words, if I didn't have to carry you, this would be easier. And he's saying, no, if you weren't carrying me, you couldn't get through it. And you've got to understand that sometimes you're carrying God into things that you think this is making it harder. But if you try to get God out of the equation, you'd never have the ability to get in and through the situation. God's presence elevates and activates our faith to step into impossible things. Try having faith without the presence of God. I know what the Word says. We need to be in the Word. I agree. Absolutely agree. You need to be in the Word. You need to know what the Word says. No question about it. We're a Word church. 
But I'm here to tell you, unless you mix, Come on. Come on. mix it with understanding and the format of God's presence, faith won't make a lot of sense. For sure. For sure. But God's presence makes faith viable and real. Why? Because in God's presence, anything's possible. Because it's not my faith that's achieving it. It's God's, my faith in God's presence that's achieving it. Because ultimately, God's presence is the thing that ensures the miraculous. Right? They stepped into the water. It wasn't, I love that God waited until they had to get their feet wet before he stopped the water from flowing. You know, and a lot of us, Lord, if you'll just get that boss out of the way, then I'll do it. Or Lord, as soon as I get $30,000 in the bank, I'll quit. Or, come on, are you with me? So we're always looking for the thing, we always look for a dry creek bed before we'll trust God. But that's not how this works. It's stepping out. It's the assumption of the risk because the Holy Spirit's informing the risk. The presence of God is informing the risk. And so we let God's presence inform it. And when we step into stuff, that's when the miracles start happening. I've never seen anybody that I've prayed for healed if I didn't pray for them. <laughs> Just think about that. It's really deep. But the point is, I'm afraid to pray for sick people. Then I guess you won't pray for them. And they won't experience a miracle. You're never going to see somebody sick, healed, unless you pray for them to be healed. And what's going to give you the confidence? Just that the word told you so? Well, sure, that'll help you. But I'm here to tell you that when you're in God's presence, there's this confidence that comes with that. The confidence to give when you ain't got it. The confidence to know that God can do a miraculous thing here simply because I'm bearing his presence. I'm aware of him being with me. Here's, here's another thing that's really important for us to understand. All, all of this is taught in this little scenario that we've just looked at. God's presence provides a way, right, for others to find God's provision, promise, and purpose. Listen, the priests, who are, who are the priests here? Okay. You guys haven't listened to a word I've said this whole message. I'm really discouraged right now. How many priests we got in the room? Thank you very much. That's what the Bible says. I just need a little help up in here. God's presence provides a way. So when the priests stepped into it, right, those that carry or bear the presence of God, when they stepped into it, that's when everybody else saw the way. And I'm here to tell you there are people watching you. And they're going to see you do extraordinary things and miraculous things and unique things and have favor in environments. And it's going to be the thing that's going to attract them to follow the path that you're on, the direction that God's giving you. And ultimately, it's about bringing people into Christ. Ultimately, it's about them being attracted. Listen, our preaching doesn't convince people of Jesus. It doesn't. It's the presence of God and our experience, our testimony. That's what does it. And when, and when you can say, I've been there and I've done that and, and this is what God's done and they've seen it. They've seen it. They've watched you from afar. They've watched how God has moved through your life when you've been fighting cancer. And they've watched how God brought you through a difficult family situation. And they've watched how you maintained your joy when the boss had it in for you. That all of a sudden, everything in your world begins to provide an avenue for others to enter into the promise that you're entering. Because ultimately, the presence of God just isn't about your benefit and your blessing. The presence of God is ultimately about bringing other people on the journey with us. And that's the joy and power of it. So Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you that we can enter your presence. Lord, that you are here You've testified, you've declared to us that you're with us. Lord, I pray that you have somehow captured the spirits of your people. That you've challenged us to step into the full measure of your grace and your goodness. Lord, I pray that right now you release an awareness. And that, Lord, we would 
Take the mantle, the anointing that you've placed upon every one of us as believers to bear the presence of God. And Lord, if there are somebody, if there are people in this room or watching online right now that have never experienced your presence, they've never had the life change that comes because you visited them in a real way in their hearts, I pray that today, right now, they will experience that. Lord, let them discover your goodness and your grace and your mercy in a moment just like this where in these tender times we feel you sweetly sweeping across our spirits and drawing us to yourself. Lord, I'm asking you to do wonders in our midst today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet all over the room? God bless you.